Welcome back to the series on the new ICF core competencies. I'm very excited here. We are wrapping up this series, so we're in the final video. And joining us today is Janet M. Harvey, and she is an MCC and a mentor coach, and she's been around uh, the coaching world for quite a long time and was instrumental in helping the team put this, the new core competencies together. So thank you so much for joining us, Janet. It's a pleasure, Brighton, and it's so important to have this conversational way for people to learn. I'm happy to be here. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, and thanks to those of you who are watching. Um, as you know, I like to dig right in, and I'd like, Janet, uh, can you tell us a little bit, just kind of an overview of this core competency? A really common phrase that people use to describe the purpose of coaching is to deepen learning so that clients forward action. And I think this particular competency, and in fact, the whole cluster about cultivating learning and growth is about the second half of that purpose. And what I appreciate a lot about the languaging in this particular competency is that it, it eliminates a lot of fuzziness that we had in the old model that had three competencies, and now we have one. And at the end of the day, it's not enough for clients to get awareness of who they are and what's motivating the way they're behaving or relating to something, it's important that they're able to translate that into everyday actions and choices and that they do it in a way that feels very respectful of who they are and the insights that have come from the session. In, in some ways, it's a little bit like the reward for the coach because they can hear the client confidently accept responsibility for making a different choice that will lead them to a better outcome. Great. Well, thank you. And, and you kind of touched on a little bit of how this was three competencies and now it's one, but maybe you can help us for those who have been really um, using for years the uh, the existing model or the older model, the core competencies. How does that translate into the newer one? So there's kind of a funny story here because when the team was working on developing the new competency model, I was a strong proponent for keeping the three but cleaning up the language. The good news is the spirit of the old three are still included in this single new competency. And let's look at it this way. When a client has reached a moment in the session when they say to themselves, wow, that's a really new way of looking at this situation that it never occurred to me I could make available to myself. Or they'll say, wow, that opens up a whole bunch of new options. I see how the belief I've been carrying just doesn't match this situation. I could do something else. There's an energy shift. There's an enlivenment. They're, they're ready to take consideration for something new. In the old competencies, we would say that's the moment to move to designing actions, which is all about starting to instill ideation. What are all the possibilities now that you know this about yourself or this insight has emerged for yourself and encouraging the client to look broadly in all areas of their lives, not just the one that they situationally might have brought to the session so that they're working with the whole self and thinking about what are the possible actions. Competency 10 was planning and goal setting. And so what happens here is that we want to promote autonomy client autonomy. What that means is, of all these possible ideas, which one will I choose? Because right now, it's the highest priority. It will have the greatest positive influence or impact on the situation that I've brought to the session. But really, it's going to help me do that in all parts of my life. So of the six or seven options, I'm picking this one. And what's important is that I implement that sometime in the next couple of weeks and I know exactly who I'm going to partner with. And that's the signal that says, ah, now they're starting to get to a place of step by step by step. How will I manage progress and accountability was competency 11. And in the new competencies, this is about really setting the client up to leave the session with everything in place. They know what their commitment is in terms of what they'll do. They know their commitment in terms of by when they'll do it. They have some sense of the connection between the learning in the session that's happened and what they're now able to say, yes, I feel ready and capable to go and implement this. And here will be my 
team that I'm going to lean into when I get concerned that maybe I can't get it done. And here's how I'm going to celebrate. I know what success looks like when I implement these new choices in my life. So 9, 10, and 11 are absolutely all embraced in the new competency of facilitating learning and growth. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation, Janet. Let's let's dig into now um, your mentor coach. And so when you are mentoring someone and you're, you're watching a tape or going through someone's coaching session, um, first, can you tell us what it's like, what you see in a, in a session when someone is doing this really well? And then after that, we're going to switch to when someone needs some extra help. So what's the, the person who's doing this uh, and has this really down pat? What does that look like? So in some ways, it's very important to look at the whole competency model in answering this question. It's very, very difficult to be successful at any level of credential in facilitating learning and growth if we haven't established and maintained an agreement that the clients fully partnered with us on. They've been able to identify what matters enough for us to talk about it, what's not known and how is that needing to be addressed in order for you to make progress towards some outcome that you're wanting outside of the session? And then, of course, there's an outcome in the session. If those elements are in place, then what happens when the insight emerges is the coach has a, I call it the compass for completing and landing the plane in the session. Because we can go back to that session agreement and say to the client, when we began, you were seeking to have an action plan for yourself to uh, shift the way this project was unfolding. And you weren't sure what was stopping you from planning because you're pretty good at it. But in this session, you've identified what's in your way. There were some assumptions and some beliefs that were actually not what was going on. So now that that's clear, what are the possible ways you could approach creating your action plan? Notice in this, it's always giving the responsibility back to the client and it is providing them the bridge because what often happens is a client gets to insight and has no idea how they got there. <laughs> so as the deep listener, the coach is able to help them stay connected to what it is they say they wanted without getting into it with them. We stay in the open-ended question as an invitation for the client to connect the dots on the learning to, oh yeah, I, kn I know how to plan. Okay, I see what's necessary next. Here's what I'm thinking about doing. And of course, we stay in that dialogue all the way through to the client has fully flushed out all the details of the commitment they're making to themselves, the what to do, the how to do it, by when and with whom, and of course, what success measures look like. A really artful coach is staying in simple, clear questions, almost like picking up a string of pearls from the client and saying, oh, this is the next step you wanna take. Well, what about this? Have you considered that? And it helps the client to keep going in their thinking and be as flushed out as they possibly can so that when they leave the session, it's in their bones. And they don't have to go back and listen to a recording or tell their coach to send them notes because the session itself has really allowed it to ground deeply into that client's natural way of learning, thinking, creating, and being in the world. Yes, th thank you so much for that. So let's flip it over um, and say you are coaching someone who's maybe a newer coach and they're struggling a little bit about this one. What are the things that you see um, coaches doing here that, that might not be the right way to do it? <laughs> well, Brian, I don't think about it as right and wrong in coaching. Rather, what's the next best option that increases client autonomy, which is a lot what this competency is speaking about. And this is an inside job for the coach. And what I mean by that is so many of us have arrived at a staging in our professional life because we're really good at solving problems. And we like doing that. We like helping other people. To be really effective in coaching, we want to be useful, not helpful, which means it's not up to us to decide what's a good thing to do. It's not up to us to even figure it out. What's the client really talking about? And do I know anything about what might be possible? So the first piece is to break the habit of being a fixer and a problem solver in favor of being a partner who is 
more focused on how do I draw out from this person what they already know that maybe they never considered bringing to this particular situation or relationship or something that they know that if they did a little variation on a theme might give them an opportunity to do something new that's useful to them. And who defines what's useful? Well, there's no way the coach can do that. That must come from the client. So when in doubt or feeling that sense of, oh, if I could just tell them to do this, it would be the right thing, to translate that into a question instead, to be sure that we're keeping the responsibility and ownership in the hands of the client. Remember, they have uh, six days and 23 and a half hours to live their lives after your session. So we get to catalyze, but not walk along with them. We wanna be sure they're really sourcing what they're choosing. Yeah, and I like your I love your term catalyze. Um, that's a great term. So, it, really quickly, let's go into just you know what's the difference between an ACC and MCC and a, and a PC or ACC PCC and MCC um, like the expectations for this competency. I think this is a great source of confusion in the industry, and I'm happy to speak to it a little bit. In the in the early going, as I said a little bit earlier. Uh, Coaches are unlearning some habits that have them entering into conversation with other people with a, a fixer mindset or a problem solver mindset. And they're unlearning that in favor of genuine curiosity, learning to ask questions they don't know the answer to and couldn't possibly know the answer to. When first starting out, coaches are encouraged to ask the client what's the territory we're going to be exploring? Um, we say sometimes topic, that sometimes makes coaches a little bit confused. So I changed that word for them to say, you know, that we could be talking personal or professional or community or family or friendships. That's the territory that we're in. Now, remember, we see clients as whole, resourceful, capable and creative in their lives. And that means no matter where we start, it applies to everything in their lives. And therefore, that's open for our exploration with them. An ACC coach is paying attention to getting to know the whole of their client, asking them about the territory, and what do you want to discover in this session that's useful to you? When they move to PCC, we're broadening that conversation to say, okay, if you were able to accomplish that objective in your life, that outcome, what would be the impact for you? Now, both of those questions are outside of the session, but they're influencing the session. So a PCC coach then says, well, given that that's what you want outside of this session, what are we talking about today that's going to be a good step to move you forward? And one more thing, what is it when you discover that and you're having an experience in this session of realizing, oh, that's the thing I want to know? What will be the way you'll recognize that? And that's emotional. Sometimes it's physical. So some people will show up in a session and say, I'm just so frustrated with this relationship that I'm in. And the coach is going to ask the question, what would be the opposite that you'd like to experience in that relationship? And the client's going to express something. Usually, I want to be at peace with it. I want to, I want to feel like I can get my breath again. I can tell I've been holding my breath. So it's, a, it's a very specific to the experience of the session itself. And what this does is make them available to consider something they haven't considered before because they're not caught up in the emotion that's got them bringing it to coaching in the first place. So these additional elements of being able to speak about what's bringing it to the surface, how are you experiencing it, what do you want instead as the success measure, and ultimately in this session, what will move you closer and help you make progress to the thing you want outside of the session. Now, when you move from PCC to MCC, everything I've just said still applies. But now what the MCC coach is paying attention to, to is a little more subtle. An MCC coach is listening very deeply for the way that this client is perceiving their life. What's their worldview in the way of values and beliefs and assumptions and preferences and habits? We're less concerned with what's the territory. 
we're even pretty unconcerned about what the outcome is because the client owns that. And given that they have responsibility to go and implement after we've catalyzed them in the system or in the session itself, what is it that they can discover about how they relate to the situation, that next situation, the next context, the next opportunity in front of them, again, broadening that territory, and start to realize that they have a set of beliefs and principles and values that are what the basis is for choosing new actions, making decisions, um, determining whether they'll give all of their energy or none of their energy to something. And this is what the MCC coach is listening to. What's that inner motivation? What's the intrinsic way in which this individual approaches their life? That when they have awareness about this, they realize, oh, Boy, that solves all kinds of different situations, not just the thing I've presented. And so it's a much more sophisticated level of relating between the coach and client, uh, often allowing things to emerge that are completely not known and no way to know by coach or client, and that they show up because the dialogue itself is willing to step outside that boundary of knowing in some very profound ways. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh distinction or that levels of distinction. But um, we are actually coming to a close on this video. We're coming to a close on this series of videos. So I want to thank you, Janet, for being here. I want to thank all the coaches that have been part of this series. And I want to thank the viewers for watching. And I want to take a, a second here to celebrate progress, celebrate the client's progress and successes. Um, so Thank you very much. This has been great that you've come along with us today or um, over the last few days of watching these videos. And uh, I encourage you to continue your learning with becoming a much better coach and working your way towards that MCC level of coach that I know is deep down inside everyone. And if you're just starting the series on this video, you can check down here and watch the series from the beginning. Otherwise, why not check out another video on the ICF's YouTube channel?